And uh, prayer, for me, is, is such an opportunity for us to demonstrate to the people in the world that we make a difference. Can you imagine in our country today, if we didn't have a lot of Christians praying, it makes a difference. And so say that uh, 75% of the Americans say that they believe in Jesus or they say they're some form of a Christian. And you think about even if just one half of those people pray, it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference how God blesses us as his people. <clears throat> and, and, and so when we pray, God does good things for us. <clears throat> Now, I, as you know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I've done prison ministry for many years, 44 years. And um, there was a time when we were wanting to have a place for men to, to go to when they get out of prison. And so we began to pray for a place. Nobody wanted that place in their community. Nobody. Uh, in Norristown, where I was a... Um, pastor of a small church, a Mennonite church in Norristown, <clears throat> and um, uh, we decided that we were going to buy a little house in Norristown on Cherry Street, which was not, not too far from the church. The pastor who had pastored this church for many years, he also went into the prison in Norristown. He was well known in Norristown as Mr. Norristown, basically lived there for 50 years and did ministry. And the children that grew up in Norristown were invited to Sunday school and he would bring them to Sunday school over the years. So he was well known in Norristown. Well, they found out that we wanted to buy a house on Cherry Street near Marshall and fix it up and house fellows coming out of prison. Guess what happened? The borough manager had a special meeting called in Norristown, and the place was packed with people. We had a lawyer with us, and that meant nothing, really, because they were out to keep us from doing anything like that in Norristown. And um, they didn't lock us up or anything because we were trying to do this, but we felt like we were the criminals, that they did not want this place in Norristown. I said to a friend afterwards, I said, you know, Norristown is not uh, known as a halfway house, but it could be known as a halfway house because they have no idea how many ex-prisoners live next door or down the street from them. And so we were not allowed to do anything in Norristown, and so there were two ladies that prayed about this, uh, the hotel they had in Schwanksville. It sat empty for two years in bad shape, needed a lot of work. A friend of mine who was on the board of Liberty Ministries, the mission that we started, <clears throat> well, he bought it. He bought the old hotel in Schwanksville and fixed it up. He said, my purpose in this is to make it for a place where we can house fellows coming out of prison. Why was that? The law says that if we have four unrelated people living in one little place, in one little apartment, that's all we can have. But a hotel has many different places. And so we began to take fellows out of prison at Liberty House, we call it, on, on Main Street of Schwanksville. And so these two ladies had prayed for many years that that place would be closed up as a hotel, as a drinking hole. Guess what it's been used for since 1984? It's been used to house Christian men coming out of prison. Where they used to drink, you know, liquor and, and alcohol, it's now we have place for Bible studies. And the place has been fixed up. The um, borough manager of Schwanksville was not like the borough manager in Norristown. He was in favor of what we were doing. So there was a, a uh, <clears throat> one year a mayor was running for office. We had been doing this ministry for several years. Nobody knew it except us. And um, not that we were trying to get away with anything. We were within the law. And so what happened was this mayor came to visit and find out what was going on in that hotel. I mean, after all, we were fixing it up. We had lots and lots of builders and, and people who get, donated their time on, on Saturdays and so forth. And the place was beautiful. 
The borough manager said, Mr. Snyder, he said it used to be that that was the worst looking building in, in Swanksville. Now it's the best looking one. Well, he passed away just a few years ago. And uh, I believe that he's rewarded for what he did because he was interested in helping in this ministry. But the fact of it is God heard the prayers of those two ladies that prayed for several years that that place would close up. It did. How was it reopened? Well, the building was originally, half of it was about 100 years old. The other half was about 150 years old. It used to be a hospitality house 150 years ago. Then it was used as a hotel uh, as it came along and, and use. And then finally, they went out of business. And now, it's Liberty House since 1984. And praise God, because God allowed us through prayer to uh, have that building. Now, Peter, Peter in the New Testament he was in prison. And uh, you notice here in Acts chapter 12, he got out of prison in a remarkable way. Um, there he was. His buddy, uh, John the Baptist, had been murdered, uh, martyred for his faith. And so Peter was going to be next. And so here we notice in, in Acts chapter 12, starting at verse 7, Behold, an angel of the Lord came into that prison and stood by Peter. And a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side, an angel, and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly! And his chains fell off his hands. You know, back then they used to chain the, the prisoners, and they couldn't move hardly. Well, the chains fell off. The, 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 the angel disconnected them. And the angel said to Peter, Gird yourself and uh, lie on your sandals, or put on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on the garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. Peter thought it was a dream that he was getting out of prison. And so he thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, open to them of his own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Now there was a prayer meeting going on there in a house, a Mary's house. And we notice in verse 11, And Peter had come to himself and said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. You know, the Christians back then, they thought they were all going to be martyrs, or at least the possibility of being martyrs. And so when God gave them life, spared their lives, they rejoiced. Now we notice in verse 12, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together, doing what? Praying. Just imagine, their prayers were answered, and the prison doors were open for Peter. Therefore, Herod uh, didn't know this, and so we notice that Peter came to the house of Mary, at the, at, a, at the door of the gate, and a girl named Rhoda came to answer it. But she thought she was seeing things. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. She forgot to open the door for Peter to get in, but ran and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. You know, we each have an angel. Coming here this morning, <laughs> some of you might have needed angels on your way too. I don't know how many accidents I have uh, not had on the way to church here over these last couple years or whatever it is. But I've had a lot of close calls. And when I was a missionary in Brazil, it was a lot worse than here. In fact, 
I was so scared I was ready to go back home. Until I said, Lord, give me the courage to drive here in Brazil or I'm going to go back home. So what I did was I decided to be like everybody else. Be crazy on the road. <laughs> just, just drive like a maniac. And so I didn't have fear anymore. But God kept us from having one accident. We never had one accident in all those years we were in Brazil and others. God protects us on the highways. We, each, some of us have more angels than others. Some of us need a lot of angels on the road. But the fact of it is that Peter, Peter, he was helped by an angel. Now they motioned to them, saying his hand to keep silent. He declared to them that Peter talked to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him, had not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And guess what? Peter was free. And Herod, uh, God spared uh, Peter's life against the wishes of uh, later on he would become a martyr. Now, in the Old Testament, we notice that prayer was going on just like today. Who was a prayer warrior in the Old Testament? Moses. He was a prayer warrior. Now, I've been, I was blessed as a young Christian to have mentors. Some of them were Sunday school teachers. Yeah, there was another man, he was like a grandfather to me. My grandfathers, uh, I was, they weren't alive when I was born. They both had big families, 11 and 12, and they died before I was born. But I had a mentor who was like my grandfather, and he took a special interest in me. For some reason or other, he saw something in me that I didn't ever see. see. But he said God had a special plan for my life, and he prayed for me every day. You know, when we started prison ministry, we did a radio program on Boyertown on Saturday nights for 10 minutes after the 8 o'clock news, FM radio, 107.5. And I did that program for nine years. And the main reason was to inform people what was happening in the prisons. That was good. And we wanted people to pray for us. Because of all the prayers of the people in the audience, which had the potential of a lot of people, and they began to pray for us. And God blessed this ministry in wonderful ways. You see, God's will is that we make a difference in our world through prayer. But we have to believe. We have to really pray with our heart. And um, now Moses was the leader, as you know, of the Jewish people who were slaves in Egypt. Now, my son-in-law is from Egypt. And uh, when, when you get to the passages in the Bible about Egyptians <laughs> having, the, um, having the Jewish people as slaves, he said to me one day, he said, you know, they were paid. <laughs> they were paid. He was trying to make himself feel better, you know, about being an Egyptian. In their history, they held the Jews as slaves. And I don't know where he got his facts from, but I kind of doubt that they were paid very much if they were paid anything. But they were slaves. And God saw the condition of the Jews at that time, that they were in desperate need of his help. And so Moses became the leader. As you know, Moses, he was a prayer warrior. And so when he became the leader, uh, he depended on God. And so when you look at Exodus chapter 32, verses 30 through 35, there were times that Moses became very weary and disappointed in God's people. You know, there, there were God's people. They were delivered from Egypt and went across the Red Sea. And they were out in the wilderness. God supplied all their food. And they, they supplied their clothes didn't wear out. Can you imagine for 40 years, their shoes never wore out. Their shirts never wore out. Their coats never wore out. And they had food. Every day, fresh food. Now, they complained they wanted some meat. And they wanted different stuff. 
they, they wanted the uh, special foods that Egypt used to have. You know, it has spice in it and all that kind of stuff. Well, God's food was good, but it was just basic, just to keep them alive. But they complained. And, um, and so God was not pleased with that. And so Moses was their leader, and he knew that God was not pleased with them. And so he had to intercede on behalf of those people because God was getting ready to punish them. He really was wanting to punish them because of their unbelief. But now we notice something about Moses. He said, now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Now what did they do? While Moses was up there talking to God, they made a golden calf out of the jewelry that they brought with them from Egypt. Imagine, they made an idol. Right in the midst of all the good things that God was doing, they made an idol, a golden calf. And then they said to Aaron, why did you do it? Moses said to Aaron, said, well, he said, I just put this stuff in the fire and it came out a calf, a golden calf. He didn't want to take responsibility for it because if he did, God was going to punish. And so, as you know, Aaron was a good leader, but he yielded to the desires of the people too much. And so the temptation for many of us is to compromise with the world, compromise with God's truth. Now, as a young person, you know, I always believed that the Bible was the word of God. But there was a time when I was in college that I began to doubt the Word of God. You know that 80% of teenagers in America today that go to church leave the church when they're in their late teens for a period and backslide. 80% of teenagers, older teenagers in America, leave the established church. How many teenagers do churches have? Well, they have a lot of children. And then, but when they get up to the age when they go to high school and they go to college, a lot of our educational institutions are anti-God, anti-Bible. My daughter, who uh, has been working for Merck, the drug company, the, one of the largest drug companies in the world for many years, she's been working there. And she took a course at Gwinnett Mercy College, which is a Catholic university up there near Merck. They paid for her to, to finish her college if she would finish it. She went to Gwinnett Mercy College. She sat in a class, a philosophy class, where the professor the first day of the year said, if you're a Christian here today, I'm going to destroy your faith and your Christianity. She walked out. She walked out of the classroom. Nobody else did. In protest. That's what's happening sometimes in our universities, colleges, etc. But the fact of it is, we need to train our young people from little on up that the word of God is true. And that if we have faith in God's word, he's going to honor us and help us in the time of need. And so Moses interceded for his people, not once, but many times. And so God honored that. And then in chapter 33, we notice Starting at verse 18, we notice that uh, God came to uh, Moses and said, I will do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, for how then, uh, Moses said, how then will it be known that your people and I found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, separate, your people and I, from the people who are, also, are, are upon the face of this earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will do, I'll go with you. And then Moses said something else in verse 18. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. When was the last time that you as a Christian have sensed God's sweet presence? You know, the Spirit of God is in our midst today. Are we really aware of it? Now, he was saying, God, I want to see a demonstration of your glory. I need to know for sure that you are with me. 
And so, I will make all my goodness pass before you, the Lord said, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you on the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face will not be seen. Moses actually saw a little bit of God. Isn't that amazing? Uh, the big responsibility he had for uh, what almost three million people that were there. And he needed a special demonstration of God's presence, glory. Well, I know that everyone goes through difficulties. And, and I've gone through many difficulties myself. But when I was in Brazil and as a missionary, I remember some things that really frightened me. We were having meetings uh, all over the south of Brazil. There were three teams. And um, the military was the, uh, <clears throat> they ran the government. And um, they had these checkpoints. So you come along and they stop you. And they check to see everything you have in your vehicles and so forth, in your person. And being from America, I never experienced anything like that. And, and, and so when I was in Brazil, they would stop us, look through all the things we have. And then if everything looked okay to them, they said, go ahead, go on. And every time we traveled, we would go through these checkpoints. Well, we were in one place in the, in the south, way down near Uruguay. And it was a small city of about 5,000 people. And we had one night meeting where we had over a thousand people. And there was a, a, a gang that came out to stop us. About five or six gangsters. They were out to harm us. Especially since I was American. And uh, the rest of the, the, the fellows, there were, there were three of us, they were Brazilian evangelists. But when they recognized that there was an American there, that even made them more angry, more hateful. And so half the people started walking away. They were in fear of what was going to happen to us. Somebody went and told the judge of that county that we might get beat up. So the judge came out to our meeting and stopped our meeting, took the microphone, and pleaded with the people not to harm these guys that had come to their city to tell them about the Lord. If we would leave in peace, will you go along with it and not hurt them? Because if you hurt them, we're going to hold you responsible. So they allowed us to gather up all our things. Guess what happened? Those that stayed about 500, I saw people crying, weeping openly because of what was happening. And we left that meeting and put everything in the um, vehicle, the sound vehicle. We got into the vehicle. A lot of, some of the people threw themselves against the vehicle as we left. We stopped at the police checkpoint outside the city and we told them what happened. They said, well, if you want to hang around tomorrow, We'll come to the meeting and we'll come there with all our machine guns and everything. And you can have a meeting the next night. We said, no, we're not going to come back tomorrow night. We're headed up to uh, Sao Paulo, which was, we already been going for a whole month. And now we wanted to get home. So when we, when we left, we praised the Lord because he helped us in our time of need. That was not just one time that type of thing happened. There were other times where I was threatened. But I, I know that God helps us in our time of need. I had 
For 20 years, I did street ministry in Philadelphia when the, in the called, what's called the Badlands, the worst areas of Philadelphia. And uh, one night, this man came over to me, and he started pushing me around and threatening me. And guess what happened? We, we had a ladies' trio, an African-American trio, three ladies that sang in a lot of places where we ministered. One of the ladies in the trio went over to the man who was threatening me, and she grabbed him by the arm and said, if you hurt him, I'm, I'm going to deal with you. And he walked away in disgust that here was a lady helping this man at this meeting. And there was just one time, there were many times, things like that happened. And so when I would go home at night, 10 or 10.30 or whatever, on the School Kill Expressway, we called it the School Kill, uh, Shore Kill Expressway. But anyway, the, at that particular time, the other highway wasn't ready yet. And, um, and so I would go home at night, and we lived in a farmhouse. I would go over to my little girls. They were just tiny at the time. I would go, and they were already asleep, and I would go over and I'd say, Lord, thank you for helping me tonight again. I won't be on Channel 3. I won't be on Channel 10. Or I won't be on Channel 6 because God helped me during those years. But you know something? There's a lot of Christians around the world that go through a lot more than that, as you know. And so I'm going to close with these verses here in John 17. John 17, verses 1 to 4. And so we see Jesus uh, praying the night before he was going to be crucified. And he was praying to the Father. And this is what he said. He spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus went back to the Father after his resurrection. And he's interceding on behalf of us every day. I don't think they sleep in heaven. Do you believe they sleep in heaven? I don't think so. <laughs> and so he is up there at the right hand of the Father ever since he went to heaven to be with his Father. On behalf of us, he's been interceding. He knows everybody's name here today. And he knows our situations. And he prays for us. Isn't that wonderful? We're not forsaken. We have a Father who cares about each one of us and knows everything about us, even before we go to Him. So, Father, we thank you today for being with us, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we leave this place today. And as the group leaves and travels today, give them traveling mercies in Jesus' name. Amen.